Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here after the night yesterday. I know it's difficult, but today is a very great day. We have the Lifetime Achievement Keynote. We have uh, two winners you saw yesterday. Uh, first, Professor Tom Garling, and then we have Professor Eric Miller. Professor Tom, Tommy Garling is Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of Gothenburg in uh, Sweden. He contributed significantly in different fields in behavioral decision making, environmental psychology, economic psychology, with lots of application in transport, application of factor affecting household satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the transport systems uh, um, and the travel choice they make. Uh, currently, he, his research focuses on the subjective well-being and daily travel. He has been a member of the IATBR since 1991. He served in the jury for the Eric Pass Prize for three years between 2000 and 2002, and was the chair of the jury in 2002. I don't uh, steal more time from him, and I leave the, word, the, the podium to Professor Tommy Garley. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, your introduction. Does, uh, is, does it work? Do you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, uh, I hadn't planned to come to this conference, really. And uh, it was not the, the case that I didn't want to, but the case is that I haven't done much research, uh, new research in, uh, on travel behavior the last two or three years. And so I didn't have much to present, really. So. Um, uh, when I was notified about, uh, and I did have no idea, no, uh, couldn't imagine that I would be given this uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, so that was really a surprise, it was a pleasant surprise. And uh, I had already, already uh, uh, signed up actually for another conference on uh, behavioral economics and economic psychology, which is the field I'm currently working in. So there was a kind of scheduling conflict which I eventually was able to solve. And yesterday when I was presented this uh, plate, I was really overwhelmed because it was so very heavy, you know. <laughs> so I think I forgot to say thank you. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to say now. Thank you all. I'm very honored. It's uh, in a way the, the word of my lifetime, I think. So the next question is what I'm going to say today. Well, I asked uh, Elisabetta and I asked uh, Abdul, of course, that was silly to ask that question because it's up to me what I'm going to say. But still, they gave, Abdul gave me some ideas about what others have said in, in this kind of talk. And I, you mentioned something about the future. Well, I thought the future is not very bright, not for me anyway. So maybe I look back to see if the, the, the past was, was brighter. And that's what I'm going to do. And it was quite interesting, I think. It, a lot of memories uh, popped up. So I'm going to overview some of, or all, but not in detail, all the research I have done in this area. And this is uh, 10 projects I've been working on since I started in uh, 1982, around 1982. And uh, my background, I got, uh, in 1972, I got a PhD in psychology from Stockholm University. My dissertation was on perception of spatial relations in the environment, which is an old topic in psychology. I don't think I contribute much to that, really. Uh, but uh, it made me interested in memory for spatial relations in the environment. And when I became an assistant professor of applied psychology at Jumel University, 7,000 kilometers north of Stockholm, I started to, it was also topical actually in cognitive and environment psychology, I, I started to do research on memory of spatial relations in the environment. And uh, we got uh, generous funding from uh, Building Research Council in Sweden. And of course, um, uh, <coughs> this topic is rather related to travel behavior. So eventually, after about 10 years or so, 
I was asked by the director uh, of the transport research units at you know, um, 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 University uh, if I wanted to uh, do some work uh, for, for this transportation research unit. And that actually started with a number of studies of uh, comprehension of roads, mainly parking signs. And it was contracts with the uh, Swedish uh, government agency of traffic safety. But I was more interested in uh, something else, which we eventually got funding for, namely how, how households make decisions about travel. And uh, we conducted a study of um, household travel behavior during a week, which actually was the first one in Sweden of that type. And I call this household logistics, as you can see. But uh, I wasn't really interested in how people travel. I was interested in how they make decisions. And that's about both, both activities and travel, and the interrelated decisions, and also within the household. At that time, I think I was a bit naive about the difficulty in studying it. But anyway, it led to this first main project, the project that I shaded, I will talk a little more about. Actually, I will talk almost about them. Uh, namely, uh, the modeling of, um, of uh, interrelated activity travel decisions. But I also was involved in some other research, uh, which um, and eventually actually I became the, the, the director of this transportation research uh, from 87 to, to 92, actually. And um, in that, uh, uh, actually I had to, <laughs> I not to say had to, but I was involved in some projects that had a much more, more applied uh, applied uh, aim, like uh, application and evaluation of stated preference methods, which I did with um, uh, for Stockholm Public Transport Company, and also in, involving uh, the Hague Consulting Group. group. That's the first time I met Mark Bradley and Eric Cruz. And also uh, uh, the, another project having to do with um, with the uh, household replacement purchases of, uh, of automobiles. I also uh, uh, we conducted a rotating panel to study household decision making from they had some idea of they wanted to replace the, the car until they, they did replace it. And um, um, this uh, research unit has been involved in research on taxi for, for many years, so there's a lot of data on that. So um, before the, tax, the deregulation of taxi in Sweden, the research unit was asked to do an evaluation before and after, which we actually did. And that uh, resulted in a publication in, uh, I think, uh, Journal of uh, Transportation, Economics and Policy. Uh, what we did there was something different than economists usually do, namely just measure access. We also measured satisfaction. This was the first study in which I actually uh, did some, something on satisfaction. And um, we also did a, a project. Uh, well, after I came to Gothenburg as the full professor at the Department of Psychology, uh, we did a study of um, that was very early then. Feasibility of use, use and attitudes towards use of electric vehicles. We had a, set, a number of uh, uh, <laughs> Renault Clio that we had households to test. The problem with these uh, cars was that they didn't work very well when it was raining. It's raining most of the time in, in Gothenburg almost. So that was a problem we had with this study. But uh, we also developed, uh, I think that has been done uh, later, we developed a computer program so we could actually simulate at an individual level the feasibility for, for households to, to use uh, electric cars. And then we tested that simulations against uh, empirical data. And we did find that uh, people uh, really were able to use electric cars 
even given the limited range they had at that time. Of course, Gothenburg is not a very big city. It's about um, 500,000 residents. And then, um, uh, since I had a background in environmental psychology, as I think Elizabeth uh, mentioned, I was interested in, had done some uh, research in parallel on uh, uh, environment concern and pro-environmental behavior. Uh, we, I and my collaborators become interested in travel demand management, focusing, targeting uh, uh, reduced car use. And we did several studies of that during a, per, a per, this period between from 2001 to 2010. And finally, uh, another project was uh, satisfaction with travel. Of course, there are a lot of people have been working with, which are all quite thankful towards. And in particular to uh, Margareta Freeman and uh, Lars Olsson, who were my graduate students. And uh, uh, we have been working together for the last uh, 10, 10 plus years. And also Dick Etema, I think I was a kind of an informal uh, external advisor of his dissertation work and uh, Satoshi Fuji, who came uh, to Gothenburg 20 years ago to do a one-year postdoc with me. His uh, advisor was uh, Yoshi Kitamura, Kitamura, and he once told me he didn't understand why he, he wanted to come to Gothenburg. He had so many other opportunities, and I think he had. <laughs> but he told me once that he's very interested in psychology. I'm not that interested in psychology, I think, as, he, as much as he is. <laughs> Anyway, we formed a team and worked uh, for a long time on, different, on, on some of these different projects. I also would like to mention uh, Reg Gollich, who uh, was a professor of, uh, of geography at, here in Santa Barbara. Actually, I met him uh, already in uh, 1981 when he asked, I was on sabbatical in Berkeley, and he asked me to come down to give a talk here. We had done very similar research for, uh, for a decade, in, in his case, a little more than a decade, on spatial cognition. And uh, I have met him many times here and many other places around the world, and we have been doing research in collaboration on different projects. Not on, on spatial cognition, however, because um, uh, he had very good uh, connections here with psychologists and also because he sadly became blind in the 1980s. He became interested in blind mobility. Uh, and he did a lot of work on that. Uh, uh, that was not my interest directly. But we did uh, work, uh, joint work on, on other topics. And we also, uh, early uh, 89, published a joint review of uh, research on spatial cognition related to large-scale environments. So these are sort of some guiding principles in my research, which I don't know if I, if I have lived up to, but I have tried. I think I would, would make a point of the last point there, disseminating results appropriately. There are many psychologists now working in this field, but they are not known so much to this community, I think, because they don't publish in transportation journals, uh, which I have done. I have 65 publications and 54 uh, is in transportation journals, which I think uh, is valuable because that, uh, that makes this research um, uh, um, uh, recognized by, by travel behavior researchers, which they may not be otherwise. For instance, bus for Planken and Linda Steg and uh, several others have not uh, really published uh, to, that extent, uh, to that extent in uh, transportation journals, but rather in social psychology journals, for instance. For instance, Journal of Applied Social Psychology. I have also published in psychology journals, but not so much on transportation. So, modeling interrelated inter activity travel decisions. Um, as I said before, uh, we started rather earlier, we formed uh, an interdisciplinary group 
in which he actually read uh, was included, and his students, Sucharita Gopal. Uh, there were one econometrician and uh, one um, uh, geographer who had done, uh, actually pioneered research in Sweden, research on uh, microsimulation. And um, uh, two other psychologists, which, which were my colleagues. And um, I, I know at that time, we actually, of course, knew about the research by Peter Jones and others, also including one psychologist, actually. And in particular, uh, the, the development of Star Child by Will Rucker and uh, Mike McNally in Irvine. So what could we do? Well, we tried actually to implement uh, in a kind of a theoretical framework what we call, refer to the scheduler. Uh, ideas or, or facts or theories from cognitive psychology. So I think that was our main contribution. The, the schedule, schedule never became an operational model. Uh, and um, some, uh, uh, there was some uh, work after us that have been become much more useful to planning and so on, and also been more, more uh, sophisticated, sophisticated in terms of uh, modeling, like uh, the work by Eric and uh, Rorla, and uh, of course, uh, Harry Timmermans and Theo Arendse, and uh, Bauman and uh, Ben Akiva. Uh, now, I wasn't so interested in the operational model because I'm not an engineer, so I wasn't so interested in applications. I was more interested in in uh, the problem of uh, understanding interrelated choices. That is, top that is a topic that hasn't been much research in psychology, actually. And um, what I did later, which has perhaps been less recognized, was um, uh, applying this idea about uh, cognitive algebra from Norman Anderson, uh, which we actually did in a paper published in environment and planning, A. And also uh, heuristics for um, how to simplify these kind of interrelated choices. Um, and um, we actually did research uh, resulting in what we call the uh, uh, loss sensitivity, which should be distinguished from loss aversion, which is a principle uh, that could be applied to understand how people uh, simplify interrelated choices by focusing on losses rather than gains. And uh, two of the publications uh, I have mentioned here uh, was uh, actually uh, related to this. So the feasible infeasibility of activity scheduling is, I think, solved by Two, two things. One is application of heuristics, and the other one is learning. And of course, learning has been an important part, I think, of the work by uh, Timmermans and, uh, and Arendse. Travel demand management and, uh, uh, and core use production. Um, what we did there was uh, this uh, paper published in which we tried to apply um, uh, what's called in psychology, in, in social psychology, goal setting theory and um, uh, control theory of self regulation proposed by Carl and Scheyer. And the idea was is that um, when people uh, <coughs> Are, are uh, required or asked or, or want to change uh, a habitual uh, behavior, routinized behavior like travel, they are reluctant to do that. I mean, change could be something you desire, but if it's routinized and it works, you're reluctant to do it. So um, the first thing is to have people set the, the goal of changing. And you can ask, what are the determinants of that? And second, how do they, how do they, how do they attain that goal? What, what, how do they implement it? And we propose the cost minimization principle, implying that people 
have experienced psychological costs like inflexibility of changing to some other, for instance, travel mode. So that was the, the idea we had, which is different from many other ideas about change, behavioral change. And here are some empirical results, two dissertations. Results were not exactly as we expected. Results never are. But they were in, in line with our, our ideas, but it's more complicated. And more research would be interesting to do on this, which I haven't done, but maybe some others would be interesting. Then we did research on public acceptance and effectiveness of rule pricing. And that was really a controversial issue in Gothenburg at that time. Now it has been implemented, uh, first in Stockholm and then in Gothenburg. And we had a, a broad approach. First of all, we applied the same idea about cost, cost minimization um, to, um, to the effects of road pricing, the effectiveness of road pricing. But we were also interested in, in uh, investigating public attitudes and uh, political uh, feasibility and acceptance, attitudes and acceptance. Attitudes we have before and acceptance after. And uh, then uh, we published a paper on, uh, oh, sorry, a chapter. I did a chapter with uh, Margareta Freeman. In that chapter, we started with, with these observations. We, we, we draw a parallel to, to um, drug addiction. So increases with, so car use increases with easy access to cars, cannot be restrained to essential use. The goal is a trip leads to bodily changes, weight increases, reduced fitness. Problem in is denied and others, the society is blamed. And successful treatment is effortful and takes time. Relapses unless values change, selling the car. So if you believe in this, you may ask, is voluntary change of, uh, is voluntary reduction of car use really feasible? So what we did was, uh, reviewing previous research, these so-called travel feedback programs or personal, personal travel programs. And we did a meta-analysis of uh, some uh, studies that had were sound methodologically, mainly studies by, uh, by Satoshi in ja Japan with uh, collaborators. And uh, we found that um, uh, there are relatively large effects, but the problem is, I think, that uh, those participants are really positive from the start in many cases, and that hasn't been adequately controlled. And the final satisfaction with travel. Actually, satisfaction was something I started to become interested in already before 2000, because um, when I was an advisor of Marietta Freeman's dissertation. And she worked in uh, Karlstad at, um, in a research group uh, interested in, uh, as part of uh, the center of, um, of uh, service research. So satisfaction is, of course, a very important uh, construct and, uh, uh, in uh, service research. And uh, what we did here, I had actually done several studies before, published in uh, the, the Journal of Happiness Studies and the Journal of Positive Psychology and some other journals on uh, subjective well-being and emotional well-being. And the idea was to apply to that, that to um, satisfaction with travel <coughs> and uh, to find out whether there was some relation between satisfaction with travel and um, overall satisfaction or domain satisfaction and emotional well-being. The distinction is usually made between these different uh, concepts, even though they all tend to be correlated. And that's what we did in several studies. I think uh, what we did, which not others have done, is our focus on emotions, how you feel during travel and you feel after travel and how your feelings after travel depend on characteristics of travel. Do I have any time left? One minute. Pardon? One minute. <laughs> Good. 
<laughs> it's not minus anyway. <laughs> not, not yet. So I skip something here then. I have some, well, I, can't, I think I will, must mention this research we did on anticipated time pressure in activity scheduling. Not, not many others have done anything like this. Actually, we, we, what we did was we recorded regular activities in a student center. How many times per week, every week, every month, and so on. So all, all everything was routine activities. And then we did simulations. We found that almost never are two days alike. They're always different. You know? So what is routine? Routine activities lead to different, different activities every day. Therefore, travel also must be different to some extent. So that's what we did. And um, we also found, by the way, that, that time pressure was rather frequent in students. I never believed that, actually. I thought they were very, had a very leisurely time. But that was not, not the case. Well, there were some edited books. I, I, I think you, you know all of them. So this is my final slide. Everything was clear, or, or nothing was clear. <laughs> Wait, John. Oh, yeah, yeah, John. Is that there? I just wanted to make sure Tom and you were expecting him. Um, thanks a lot. I, I found it real interesting, your, your history of looking at car ownership. And I was wondering, what before learned, this is now one of the big issues, is are people going to I don't hear. Cars? I don't hear. Could you? Can you come here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a, uh, my hearing is not very good. So now car ownership is such a big question in our, uh, in our discipline now. We're trying to look at car ownership and whether people are going to not own cars anymore. And I'm wondering about your insights from your research on the psychology of car ownership. And when we do research now going forward, what we should be thinking about in terms of... Mm. Uh, Car ownership. Well, as I said, we did some study of replacement of cars, and the idea behind that was whether people replace their cars earlier than needed, so to say. But um, that's the only thing I've done about with the car ownership. And, um, and of course, I know that others are doing research on that. Even the psychologists are doing it. For instance, there is research in, in Norway uh, by Klöckner. And um, the issue has been how much um, environmental attributes influence choices of, of cars in their research. But that's as much as I know. But it's important, of course. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for your presentation. I am Pablo Guarda from uh, Catholic University of Chile. Um, I know, like, uh, what are your thoughts about, uh, like, re replicability in, like, transportation studies? Because I know, like, uh, kind of a decade ago, there were a crisis of replicability in psychology, a lot of discussion on p-hacking, and... I feel uh, you talk about garbage in about and garbage out, like about the data collection methods. So I'm just wondering if you feel we need to do something about repli replicability uh, of experiment, like in, to study travel travel behavior problems. Oh, I don't think I've <coughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good question. I mean, this is a replication crisis in psychology that you may know of. And it uh, extends now to eco economics and to medical science and so on. So um, 
Yeah, I'm not so much in favor of um, doing anything, <laughs> because I'm too old. <laughs> but I think one, one good point is that um, you should be very careful about uh, the background of your study, I mean the theoretical background, before you do a study. So don't test so-called sexy hypotheses, which you think you may, will make recognition. But be careful in, in thinking out what, what, uh, what is the background and so on. But the, because that has a very big effect on the, on the statistical power. You know. I think we can thank again a lot.